And that's the beauty of trademark is trademark cuts both ways because Apple as a brand is means something negative to you. And so you make future decisions based on that. Very, so very good the, point. The whole point of trademark is it cuts both ways. It's complicated is basically the answer yeah. to this and many other legal questions. So you guys, if you haven't seen it, you should go watch Lewis Rossman's video about getting his batteries stolen by Apple. Hi. A few days ago, we published a piece with CBC that showcased how the Apple Store was trying to charge somebody between $1,200 to $2,000 for a machine that needed nothing other than an LCD display cable because somebody had accidentally bent it, most likely while trying to install their own screen. Here, just a few days later, crazy coincidence, imagine that, is that I had my parts seized by Customs. So let's just go over this letter where they explain to me why Apple and Customs seized batteries to a computer that at their store they will no longer service because they claim it's vintage. He claims that he had batteries that were being imported from, a, from being refurbished and that those batteries were seized by Customs as counterfeit. Now, our special guest here, Kurt Mueller, your favorite patent attorney, has done two videos already on the issue of customs enforcement and trademark. And I believe this even applies to patent and copyright as well. Kurt, do you want to, um, you want to say anything about that? Yeah, you can go watch both videos. In the first video, I assumed that when he referred to them, he meant original as in Apple products. And then I considered the possibility that he might have meant refurbished batteries. And then there's to go to the trademark law question, which is the operative question for the moment. It's like if you're importing something that has Apple's branding on it, but it's refurbished, is it still Apple's product? And if not, then should Apple be able to exclude that? And the answer is maybe. So that's the analysis there. Um, I'm also going to post a link here to a PowerPoint presentation that I found on, it looks like the University of Dayton Law School's website. I'm not entirely sure if they meant for this to be public, but the way HTTP requests work, in my humble opinion, uh, I made a request and they sent me a public document. So I'm not necessarily yeah. going to display the entire document, which could be considered uh, not a fair use, but we can certainly give you a link and 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 talk about the contents without infringing on anyone's copyrights. Because again, you're going to go make an HTTP request and get the document yourself. And this document is by Barry Irwin. Um, I'm assuming he's a lecturer, he probably a lawyer, uh, and, and probably uh, an expert, although we're not supposed to say the word expert in <laughs> law, right? Uh, in, in customs and trademark enforcement. The, basically, the way it works, the short version, because I know we can get quite long here, the short version is that under Title 19 of the U.S. Code, there is a way to enforce certain copyrights, trademarks, or patents in customs so that imported products cannot or imported products that are counterfeits can potentially this is this is a very kind of rare thing that happens, but potentially can be identified and uh, stopped before counterfeit goods enter the U.S. I'll give you my personal example without revealing confidential information. I represented a major corporation that does business internationally. They ship products worldwide. I, I cannot go into any more detail because someone could then guess which company. But I worked, I represented them as their trademark attorney. And this particular company, very much like many other companies, had a problem with counterfeit goods. They actually had a display case of counterfeit goods that they had discovered over the years. And the counterfeits were really, really good looking counterfeits. The trouble is, a trademark is a identifier of the origin of goods, so a counterfeit is obviously invalidating or infringing upon that source of the goods because the counterfeit doesn't come from the original manufacturer. It comes from some third party. And as good as that product may look on the outside, it is usually a very cheap counterfeit product on the inside and usually not anywhere close to a proper 
original product, the quality of the original product. And even if it was the quality of the original product, it is still not coming from this, the correct origin, so it is still an infringement. But the major problem is that the, is that people will go and, and associate the quality of the counterfeit with the goodwill or the, the original business. Let, let's use the battery example real quick. Let's say you order some batteries online, because this happens to me. I make e-bike batteries. That's what that glowing orange thing is back there which is apparently already dying. Thank you, 299 from CVS. The batteries I order for e-bikes, you have to be very careful because what, believe it or not, what, what counterfeit manufacturers do, they'll take the metal case of one of these batteries and wrapped up in here in a, in a, in a spiral is the lithium ion material and an insulator and a dielectric or something like that. And then it's connected to the terminals on each end. And what they'll do is they'll put less material in there, plus a couple weights, and then they'll close it, close it up and weld it like a regular cell. But it will be one third or less the capacity, just enough so that you can think it's taking a charge and think that it's working properly. But then why are my batteries dying so quickly? So when I order these things, I have to be very careful to get them from either a reputable manufacturer, a reputable source, or someplace with purchase protection. In this case, I ordered these as old new stock laptop batteries. So if we knew that a certain laptop was made with genuine cells, I could go buy some genuine cells from that manufacturer and rip them apart and get maybe like eight or 12 of these batteries out of each laptop battery at a cost of about a dollar or dollar fifty per battery, which is not bad. But now imagine you're Apple and you are manufacturing laptops and things like the Galaxy Note 7 or 8 or whatever blow up when the battery is, is you know, improperly installed or whatever. So you do have some sort of interest in preventing people from importing or selling counterfeit batteries with the Apple logo on them because what if somebody goes on the news and said, I bought this and it said Apple on it and it blew up and uh, don't buy Apple. That would be, that would be terrible for Apple. I mean that if it was deserved, great, like Samsung deserved it when their, when their batteries blew up. But if it was because someone had imported counterfeit Samsung batteries and they blew up and made Samsung look bad, as much as we like or don't like Samsung or Apple, that's not, that's not proper. That's not the way we want it to work. So you, you have this, this, where these two interests run into each other at full speed, where Lewis Rossman wants to be able to import uh, batteries from anybody who, well, really, he, he wouldn't even need to import them if he could get them in the States. But as someone who orders parts for e-bikes and makes e-bikes, a lot of parts come from China or India. It's going to come down to where, how these two forces, an unstoppable force and an immovable object, how they, how they, how they, how they had, how they butt heads. Um, Kurt's going to, Kurt went over in his video, I'm pretty sure, that Lewis probably hasn't seen any of this merchandise with his own eyes yet. He might have gotten a picture at best, but he probably didn't even get a picture. And so he's guessing that his refurbisher or source or supplier sent the batteries in the right way, marked with the right stuff or whatever. But if they didn't, there really could be a crate of properly refurbished Apple laptop batteries, but they still have all the Apple branding on them and aren't properly marked as not unauthorized refurbished or whatever. Now, what about that? What about them being unauthorized? Well. How about this analogy? Leonard French makes e-bikes. I really do. I like to make e-bikes. I just finished an e-trike. That, that battery back there with the orange lights on it is, is waiting for its battery management board to be soldered to it, and then it, it'll be permanently installed in the trike until it dies. I don't expect it to last terribly long, maybe another year, but another year of testing is really all I need before I can invest in a good battery and build it. I built a good battery out of old cells. That was my test, and if... And if, and if that succeeds, then I'll be confident in buying a much more expensive set of cells and welding them together and all that. Imagine I do all of that and I start selling Leonard French branded batteries, or excuse me, Leonard, yeah, or Leonard French branded batteries or Leonard French branded bikes. And 
somebody drives off with one of my bikes under warranty, goes and has a good time, and then later on needs some kind of maintenance. Well, anybody who's owned a bicycle knows that bikes need lots of maintenance. So even the best bikes, you're going to have to clean them and, and stuff. So something's going to go wrong with the bicycle. And then if it's an electric bicycle, something could go, go wrong with the electronics. One time I had a client who ordered a, a bike from a same manufacturer that I represent, but a different uh, location. And somehow they let him out of the building with the thing, with the battery not seated properly. And he got it onto the trails and the battery would unseat every time he hit a bump. And all I had to do was just grind off a sixteenth of an inch of the of, of the battery mount because it had been somehow manufactured a sixteenth of an inch too large and it was causing the battery to unseat. Then it s sat properly, then it locked in place and it wasn't going anywhere. Now I was an authorized person because I, I represent a particular e-bike manufacturer, but what if I had been unauthorized? I just altered the manufacturer's product. I mean, I did a good job and everything, but who checked that? Nobody checked that. The original manufacturer didn't verify that it was done properly, that it's that it lives up to the company name or anything. Uh, in their defense, neither did my company, but at least I signed papers that said that I'm responsible. But the, the concept would be that someone would be properly licensed or insured or whatever, indemnifying the original manufacturer if they are an authorized reseller or refurbisher. But if you watch Lewis Rossman's videos, Apple doesn't really do it that way. When you go to an Apple authorized repair center, you're often just dropping it off and it's really an Apple authorized shipping center, according to Lewis Rossman. Yours truly has not dealt with Apple for several years after I got the lock screen button problem on my iPhone 5 and Apple wanted $150 to fix it, even though it was under warranty. They said that I had a chip in the side of my screen glass, and even though the screen and the glass were just fine, they said that they were going to have to replace the glass when they replaced the lock button issue, and that in doing so, I would receive a benefit of having my screen glass fixed. And because I was receiving a benefit of having my screen glass fixed, they had to charge me a little over $150 to fix my warrant to my phone under warranty. I told them they were nuts. I basically told the entire store exactly how I felt about their service. And I walked out and never bought anything from Apple ever again. And that's the beauty of trademark is trademark cuts both ways. Because Apple as a brand is means something negative to you. And so you make future decisions based on that. Very, so very good the, point. The whole point of trademark is it cuts both ways. So it's like, should if if this if this battery think about it this way, it's like if the battery comes in and would fit in another component for some reason, but it's an Apple branded battery, well, maybe you wouldn't use that because you don't like Apple. But wait, it's not really an Apple battery because it's remanufactured. So maybe you would use it. And it's like so that cuts both ways too. It's complicated is basically the answer yeah. to this and many other legal questions. There are ways to report to Customs and Border Protection that you have counterfeit goods that that are that are that you I think are, are being imported into the country and should be identified and held. I'm not exactly sure whether Apple has the power to say we want you to hold Lewis Rossman's goods. I think it would be more like Apple would say we believe people in general are importing batteries, so please keep on, on the lookout for Apple branded batteries that are coming in from overseas. The only authorized sources are X, Y, and Z. Kurt, what do you think about that? Yeah, I mean, it sounds right to me. Do, do, you, do you think there's any way that, that Apple has some personal contact at Customs Border Protection and, and they were able to say, you should go get this guy, Lewis Rossman, we think he's counterfeiting stuff? I don't believe they specifically targeted Mr. Rossman in particular, no. That seems very, very unlikely to me. It's entirely likely that they say, we, we're concerned about the refurbished batteries and we want you to look up for refurbished batteries. That I buy. But do they say, go target Mr. Rossman because he's mid mean to us? No. Yeah, and let me let me be clear here. I'm on Lewis's side, 100%. But I... I'm gonna let me let me let me let me tell you a quick story. When I was a kid, a friend and I were driving down the highway, 
and those overhead highway street lights. It was nighttime. They were all on and they have a, a mechanism in them that when they get hot, they turn off. Like if, if a thing just has been on for a while and hasn't been cooling off and it just gets to a point where it's a little bit hot, it turns off and cools off and then turns back on later on. A little little piece of bi, bi metal in there, bimetallic switch in there, and it just turns it off. Well, my friend sees one of these turn off and she gets all excited. She says, I'm so special. I feel so special. I, I, those things only turn off when I'm around. And I said, how, how would you know? <laughs> exactly. Exactly right. <laughs> and she said, she, she immediately got this big frown on her face. It was like, oh, I hate you so much for bursting my bubble. Why did you do that? <laughs> yeah. So... Lewis Rossman makes videos about how he hates Apple all the time. He makes videos critical of Apple several times a week. He's trying to tell people all about how horrible Apple is pretty much every day. So when exactly do you expect Customs and Border Protection to do this at all and not have it be a coincidence with something he has said about Apple? Y yeah, except I'm going with the coincidence theory. It's like, it's like <laughs> I, I, does, does, does Apple hate him? Sure. Do they yeah, yeah. No, that's what I'm within, saying within, is that the mechanisms he, of their if power he to thinks it, yeah. they did this in response to a particular video or particular criticism, certainly not untrue. It's not po it's possible. It's not. It's plausible. But uh, I, I don't think that we can statistically say that he makes videos critical of Apple every day. Therefore. Any one of those videos could be said to be well. They did it because of this video. If if they did it a month from now, it'd be for so it'd be you know we would be saying or he would be saying oh they did it because of that video. So 19 U.S.C. 1499 authorizes examining goods for compliance with U.S. laws, including trademark goods that are suspected can be detained for up to 30 days. The mark owner gets contacted under 19 Code of Federal Regulations, Section 13321. So Apple would have been contacted and told, here's the goods. Apple actually doesn't receive any information about the importer's identity. Meanwhile, Lewis would have received unredacted photographs of the allegedly offending material. The mark owner then makes the decision on whether the detained merchandise is counterfeit or infringed. Infringing. The importer is provided an opportunity to respond or produce a licensing agreement. The merchandise is either released or seized at the end of the detention period. The importer is required to be informed by CBP both of detention and the seizure and rights afforded. Right. This is what Customs does every day with their time, among this many is, things. This they, is they Customs' screen, job, yeah. Yeah, they screen for counterband, which means drugs, stolen stuff, and all kinds of things. So yeah, but the thing is like they do this in math. So, you know, yes. the idea that the idea that Apple contacted uh, uh, customs and said, Hey, can you look out for stuff for Rossman and in their, in their business with their many, many, many things they screen, they somehow noticed it was a Rossman product. It's like, Oh, we'll open that to make sure it's like, no, yeah. I don't so buy it. instead what it looks like happened was customs and border protection was screening for counterfeit products in general, maybe Apple, maybe counterfeit Apple products. Why not? They're one of the biggest companies in the world, which would also make them one of the biggest companies in the country. So they're screening for that automatically. My guess I certainly could be corrected here with, with future facts, but it's my guess is that they were screening normally. They did come across this shipment. They had doubts. They sent, it looks like they contact the trademark owner first and Apple would have made a decision to seize the goods. Then Lewis Rossman gets contacted by Customs Border Patrol saying his goods have been seized and here's how you respond. Then he puts out his video and now here we are. He now has to respond. He'll probably hire a decent trademark litigator or someone with the international goods experience or something and hopefully be able to respond to this with what's going on here. A um, couple ways a scenario could play out. If the batteries are genuine but have been refurbished and still have an Apple logo, good question, right? Exactly. <laughs> like, I don't know. So... If it's properly refurbished, but it has an Apple logo, you there's going to be a deep inquiry into how they were refurbished and exactly when it crosses the line. 
because maybe refurbished simply means they wiped the outside of the battery with soap and water because it was dirty. That would seem to me to not be a violation of Apple's rights. But if they had to solder stuff to the batteries, or they had to like unsolder some cells and like replace bad cells with good cells and all that, eh, you're making a new battery now, and the quality of your solder joints and your welds and all that is going to affect the quality of the battery. So now take that Apple logo off of there and just sell it as a battery. There's a line here is what I'm getting at is somewhere in there without going into hours and hours and hours of case law that you were I mean, I don't maybe you did it. I don't know it, but I didn't I didn't do the deep dive. No. Yeah, the deep dive is going to be we want to get paid, man. I mean, anybody would want to get paid. It's going to be hundreds of hours of research. You know, if you don't know it already, if you know this stuff already, then of course you want to get paid because you learned all that. So this is not going to be cheap for either side, but. I think Apple has a lot more money than Lewis, and we know how that works out. So hopefully Lewis can pull this off, but it's not all him either. Like, it's entirely possible that Lewis's source sent counterfeit or sent branded batteries that should not have been branded. Yeah, I mean, he, he, he has no idea that they are authentic. He can't possibly know that. I mean, he could know at best that he works with a reputable supplier who typically sells that. But it's like, well, it's yeah. true every other time. Doesn't mean it's necessarily so true. So I'm still 100% on Lewis Rossman's side and that Apple, you know, could totally be messing with him. But that's the game. I mean, he's ordering parts from a foreign country and they go through a check for being counterfeit. So if they are. Now, the other, the, 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 the third third of this or the fourth third of this... <laughs> is that you really can get in trouble for uh, counterfeiting, for trying to import counterfeit products, at least allegedly. Here is an article on Rack.com from January 8th, 2018 by Hillary George Parkin. Hillary George Dash Parkin. She, I'm guessing, says that uh, Harper Reed, an entrepreneur in residence at PayPal and the former chief technology officer for Obama for America tweeted that he had purchased a suitcase that ended up being counterfeit. He purchased it on Amazon and it was seized at customs and Amazon gave him his money back. But he recently went for his global entry interview, which is a sort of expedited way through customs. You sort of go through a security clearance ahead of time. And he was denied this heightened security clearance because of the allegedly counterfeit suitcase. Well, thank you for joining us. That is our show, everyone. I am Leonard French, your favorite copyright attorney. And joining us today has been Kurt Mueller, your favorite patent attorney. Reminder that he has produced two videos on the Lewis Rossman trademark thing and I'm going to have a link in the description of any of the videos that we produce so go and see that and if I can remember I'll make a card for it right here we have hit a hundred thousand subscribers thank you very much for helping us celebrate that thank you very much to our patreon supporters you can support the channel financially at patreon.com slash lj french at the $50 level in October, thank you to Jonathan Doe, John Steele, Gavin Barnard, Evie, Andy, Kyle Mudrock, Veriment Tain, Sean McNamara, William Gonzalez, Michael Pierce, Grunkle Tia Marie, Terry Crisp, Richard Fournier, Michael Jones, Spirit Bear, and Jan Negre. And thank you to the $5 plus supporters who will be on the crawl and are scrolling on the LED panel behind me. So that is our show, everyone. Have a good one, and I will see you in the videos this week. I hope you all have a good week. You deserve it. Love you all. Bye. Decided to become very cloudy at this exact moment in time.